and that sort of thing. But the best thing to do is to work on your interviewing skills initially. Yeah. Okay? Test shows and all yeah, that. Shows. Start small and then go big. Like exactly. Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh. Well, it was built in about two and a half weeks, actually. <laughs> um, no. What's your next question? Um, uh, two more. Where does NARF come from? NARF was, I, you know, honestly, it was. It was written, um, it actually came from a guy named Eddie Fitzgerald, who was one of the animators. And trust me, you look at Eddie Fitzgerald and you think he looked like Pinky. <laughs> um, and which is probably a good and an odd thing. Um, but yeah, he used to say things when he would make a mistake and say, oh, narf. <laughs> I don't know why, but luckily that came to some odd you know, situation for Pinky. And may I suggest a guest for your show? Please. Cap Susie. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have her on. I love Cap. She's it, it, sometimes it's just hard with scheduling issues, but yeah, she's a lovely woman and she's very talented. But I will. She's um, my favorite cartoon character. Oh great. Well, then Sally Acorn. I will tell her that you specifically requested that she's on, yeah. and then I can say, hey, dude, it's Zach that wants it, so I have to yeah. say. That. Well, I love Sally. She's so good. Well, thank you, buddy. Thank yeah. you for asking so many questions. But I'll tell you one thing. You rock. You're the best, man. Thank you, Zach. I love you. Rob Paulson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Nice to see you again. I figure the songs are coming later, but uh, since I know uh, Nations of the World is probably more popular, I want to specifically request uh, Yakko's Universe if we have time. Oh, that's the one, yeah, that's and the one that I can do a little bit of that. Uh, well, I'll segue into the uh, one of the talking about Yakko's Universe, one of the most memorable uh, moments of Animaniacs, other than the songs themselves, was the uh, back of, for those of you who are like, the yeah, Animaniacs, of course, was in the very early days of the internet. And generally, like people yeah. in college and stuff had internet access and on slow modems and such. So, one of the most memorable segments was the "Please, please, please get a yeah, life foundation," yeah. where a uh, <laughs> neckbeard at his desk speaking a monotone with like a robotic arm feeding a sub into his right, mouth, with, with the, talking uh, about the um, the, 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 the mathematical inaccuracies in Yakko's universe. Yeah. And uh, various like animation errors from previous episodes. Yeah. So now, of course, uh, the internet has exploded, and that yeah. everyone has access to it. And I work something you're actually meeting your fans in person. Yes. And I wonder if you have any amusing tales about that. Well, thank you. Um, uh, what you're referring to is we did an episode called the Please, Please, Please Get Life Foundation, where the show is a, uh, a fellow who's much like all of us, who's totally geeked out about cartoons and stuff, in front of the computer and saying things like. Uh, you know, dear Mr. Spielberg, in episode 6247 of Animaniacs, Yakko's pants were two shades lighter than normal. Is this a different dialogue in the ink, or was it the Tox's choice? Blah, 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 blah. Really absurd questions. And then Yakko comes in and says, Is this you? Do you have entirely too much time on your hands? You know, are you watching way too many cartoons and being on the computer all day long? Then you need to join the Please, Please, Please Get a Life Foundation. <laughs> and uh, so the, the interesting story about that is that we were clearly lampooning people who were essentially buttering our bread, you know, and I know that, and that's great, but it, but it was all in good fun, and the people, there were uh, a group of 10 or so folks who came from all over, uh, all around, and Stephen wanted to give everybody a tour of the studio, and they were all the people who really lampooned in that episode, and we're very grateful to sort of be made fun of, in a, in a, hopefully not in, a, in an offensive way. Just a quick follow-up, when you say that they were like buttering your bread, one of the things I've heard, I mean, probably no better, is that Anime actually actually had problems in later seasons that advertisers were, were sort of vexed with success among uh, people older than the ta target audience. That the, the cartoon was supposed to be for children. Originally. Well, it was supposed but to be. Uh, advertisers were saying that the numbers are high, but yeah. you know, not like few enough of those are children that it's not worth paying for the kind of numbers. Right. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing that you said. It, it was, as far as I recall, at the beginning, it was clear that it was not supposed to be a show that was just going to condescend. The audience. Yeah, we're talking Japanese. Like, yeah, or I mean, the, the you know, still you can watch Rocky and Bullwinkle or, or Bugs Bunny or any of the Looney Tunes stuff or Fractured Fairy Tales now, 50 years later, shows that were hits when I was a kid, and they're still culturally referent, uh, um, relevant. They're very funny. Um, Animaniacs is no different. It was not made just for kids. I don't know with respect to the technical terms in terms of the advertisers. But my God, we did a hundred of them, and that's a, that's a good run for anybody, unless you're The Simpsons, you know. It's a really good run. Um, and uh, it was absolutely made for what is happening now, and that is to say that folks like Zach, folks like people who are here who are, who are younger, that were not around when Animaniacs was made.
made can watch it now and still enjoy the show. The music is timeless. I mean, Randy Miguel and yeah, isn't he something? And, and uh, Rich and Julie uh, uh, Bernstein, and, uh, Rich Stone, and Steve and Julie Bernstein, incredible skill on both sides of the, of the glass. Um, but in terms of the song you were talking about, that was a little song. What's your name again, sir? Uh, Paul. 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 That's okay. Paul was suggesting about a song that we did called um, Yakko's Universe, where he says, um, Everybody lives on a street in a city or a village or a town for what it's worth. And we're all inside a country which is part of a continent that sits upon a planet known as Earth. And the Earth is a ball full of oceans and some mountains which is out there spinning silently in space. And living on that Earth are the plants and the animals and also the entire human race. Well, it's a great big universe and we're already puny. We're just tiny little specks about the size of Mickey Rooney. You may think that you're essential. Try and consequential. It's a big universe and it's ours. that one and a bunch of other ones and the original ending to that as I just sang it was supposed to be you may think that you're essential or no the way the, the way it ends now I think it goes uh, it's big and black and inky or no um, but we don't know how we got here we're an important part of it. it's a big universe and it's ours but the way it was originally written was you may think that you're essential try inconsequential <laughs> it's a small world after all <laughs> and Mr. Spielberg said no 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 <laughs> we got, got too many buddies over at Disney that would have fun with that. So, uh, yeah, it was an incredible labor of love. And now, the opportunity to come and meet people like this is so incredibly gratifying because it's clear that it's had a, a really positive impact. And it's great fun. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, my name's Dungy. Dungy? Dungy. Dungy. Yeah. Cool, like Tony Dungy. Yeah. Really? yeah. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, for one, I love. Of the night in Squishington is probably like Thank my. Thank you very much. If you ever find yourself under the toilet, sorry. <laughs> you don't need to answer that. Maybe after some really heavy party. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but that's like my family's favorite character ever. Thank so you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you and, and talk to you like this. But um, last night you mentioned that you have an affinity for music as well. Oh yeah, I became, I was a singer before I went was anything in terms of being a performer. I started my career as a singer. Um, and you did mention a bit on the side of rock. Uh, oh, yeah, what would well, be your favorite classical, as well as, say, either modern or just rock-ish uh, type of music okay. for you? Well, I um, am a, my heroes, uh, Billy West and I say the same thing, and I actually stole it from him, but my heroes as a kid uh, were always were artists, whether they're rock artists or classic music artists or painters or authors. I'm always impressed and inspired by people who are the best at what they do. Sets the bar really high for the rest of us. And I love that. Um, uh, the same with athletes. I mean, growing up in Detroit, you know, my hero has always been Gordy Howe, and he still is my hero. And I've had the good fortune of meeting and spending time with him, and he sets the bar very high in terms of the way he comports himself. But in terms of performers, man, you know, I, I, I just bought the last uh, five year old DVD and, and album, the latest Led Zeppelin record, which is, yeah. these guys, when they did it, were in their 60s. Yeah, they're still in their 60s, but they were like 61, 62, now they're in their late 60s. <laughs> and they absolutely lit it up. And for me to watch that and see guys that are 10 years and change older than I am, they can still bring it, was very exciting. Same thing with David Gilmore. Sounds pink, you know, David Gilmore sounds as good at 67 years. Jeff Beck, Jeff Beck is ridiculous. He's almost 70 years old. Stones just released a new record. Yeah. So, you know, Led Zeppelin, The Who, Jethro Tull, Emerson Lake and Palmer, yes. Um, Pink Floyd. The Beatles, of course, Stones, um, all those guys, Genesis, Peter Gabriel, great artists that I enjoyed. Uh, I also enjoyed Kenny Loggins and um, uh, James Taylor and the Eagles, Don Henley's voice is second to none in terms of his soulfulness. But being in Detroit, same thing, Marvin Gaye, The Temptations, The Supremes, Stevie, I mean, Hot King, you know, they're all inspiration and they're all relevant. For the Aretha. Oh yeah. I, I was when I, the year I happened to win my Emmy, we did it at the, it was at the Madison Square Garden in New York, and the musical guest for the Emmy broadcast there it was, was Aretha Franklin, and it was overwhelming to hear Aretha live, overwhelming. And you understand, I did it because of Animaniacs. I worked with Bernadette Peters a lot, and you understand why there are good singers and then there are stars. Yeah. And Bernadette Peters is a star for many reasons, not the least of which is. 
her incredible skill, but she just has it that you, you can't teach. Um, so, yeah, all those people were very inspirational to me. Um, and then in terms of um, modern, uh, so up-to-date sort of talent, um, I really like uh, Vampire Weekend. <laughs> I really like My Chemical Romance, although those guys are a few years old. Um, I, uh, I like, um, oh God, the guys that just won for, um, I will wait for, I will wait for. Yeah, mm -hmm. great stuff. Um, Mumford's, um, I, uh, I still have to say that when I sit back and listen to music, um, I've been playing this whole weekend, I've been listening to Led Zeppelin. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I have to say, on my car, though, on my car on XM Satellite, I listen to the Frank Sinatra channel all the time, because those people I hear this too, you know, Johnny Mercer, the Gershwins, um, Frank, uh, uh, Tony Bennett is 85 years old, and she's still absolutely freaking bring it. And um, uh, Bobby Darren, uh, these guys are just great, incredible singers. And You're just as timeless with your voice, I think. Thank you, my friend. That's very sweet. <laughs> hey there. Good How you doing, sir? Good. How are you? Fine, thank you. I'm reading. I'm not in jail, but the day's not over yet. No, it's not. <laughs> But yesterday you were talking about your experiences with your peers in the voice acting world and doing your work, and you mentioned a bit of a, a bit about them today. I was wondering what your favorite encounters with quote unquote celebrity talent are. Um, Celebrities outside. Yeah, I've had well, I've had several, and again, I mean, I have to say that um, celebrities in general. Um, I was fortunate enough, as I mentioned, I played hockey virtually until a couple of years ago. Um, but one of the great experiences I had in my life as a performer was getting a chance to play on a, on a team with a bunch of actors and we'd get go, get, go around playing the old timers of National Hockey League teams to raise money for charities. And, uh, you know, in L.A. they were like, wow, dude, you're a Ninja Turtle and, you know, and you skate backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so we ought to play on our team? Yeah, are you kidding me? So the first game that we got to play was against the Calgary Flame old timers and I was on the ice with Jim Kuklinski and Langley McDonald. And so I get a call a couple weeks after we got done and, uh, I says, uh, Rob Paulson, please. He said, hi, this is he. Hey, Rob, Lanny McDonald. I said, <laughs> <laughs> hi, Lanny. Um, yeah, listen, it's my kid's 12th birthday, and he loves turtles. Hey, would you mind talking to all the boys at the turtle party? And I'm like, no, no problem. So those happen an awful lot. And um, uh, of course, the ultimate thing for me is to have gotten to know Gordy and Colleen Howe very well. As a matter of fact, the first phone call I got in LA when I got back home, Five o'clock in the morning was from Colleen Howe. Saying, my God, Gordon, I've been watching you on TV. And I mean, that's for a kid like me to have any association with Mr. and Mrs. Hockey is pretty outstanding. In terms of LA, um, you know, Brad Garrett is one of my best friends um, from Everybody Loves Raymond because he calls himself the largest Jew in captivity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have met, he is one of my dearest friends. Um, uh, Jason Priestley, Matt Perry, wow. are all good friends of mine from hockey and from work. Um, uh, Luke Perry, as a matter of fact, came and did a bunch of cartoons when we became good pals. Um, you know, there are just so many lovely people out there uh, who have been kind enough to, uh, to be kind to me. Uh, the encounters I've had have been most memorable. I recall in the Animaniacs uh, launch party on the Warner Brothers lot almost 20 years ago. This is why we're talking about how some people are stars. And when I've had the good fortune of working with certain people who are at the top of their game, and they're lovely and, and, and wonderful people who would talk to all of us, if, if they had the time, they're just lovely people. One of them is Steven Spielberg. And I recall having worked with him on a couple of projects, and obviously on Animaniacs, and this is why those people, this, this story is an example of why those people are special. He walked up to me, and I'm sure somebody said, okay, this is Rob Ball meeting hundreds of people. He walked up to me and he, and he said, wow, great job, we love Pinky and Yakko's great and oh my God, we're so happy with this and all this other stuff. And, and I said, thank you very much, Stephen. And, and my son was with me, he was eight at the time. And I remember that Stephen, before I, the word, I could get the words out of my mouth, looked at me and said, is this your son? And I said, it is. He said, do you mind if we get a picture together? Now, how classy is that? It does two things, it completely takes the onerous onus, pardon me, onus off my shoulders to ask. And it tell, it's a story that I've probably told a hundred times. 
And so when I run into people who don't have that, who are short and unapproachable and got an ego and all that, and I just don't have time for it. I don't suffer fools well anymore because I've had the good fortune of hanging out with Gordy Howe and I'm, just, I'm, you know, I'm in the witness protection program. So you know, <laughs> tell them I'm not here. It's not really me. No, but so when, I, when I run into people and I've had the good fortune to meet people like that, or Clarence Clemens, I got to spend some time oh. with Clarence Clemens. At a, he was our honorary coach at a hockey game in um, Rochester, New York. We played the Rochester American and, uh, alumni. And um, you know, you get to hang out with people like this. It's not like you bowl with them, but when you've had this, the good fortune of getting to know them, and uh, uh, it, just, it, it just means that when somebody isn't like that, I don't, I don't have any time for that. You know? So um, I have had uh, great opportunities. Christian Slater came in and did a couple episodes of uh, Jimmy Neutron. Could not have been nicer. Roseanne Barr was just in on uh, Ninja Turtles. It was great. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh, and the guys I work with on Turtles. I mean, the new Raphael is Sean Astin. You guys all know Sam Wise, right? And you work with his dad. So and John, <laughs> his father. And when I was a kid, The Addams Family was one of my favorite shows. And so I did two shows with John Astin. I did Tasmania and um, The Addams Family, which of course he played Gomez. So now I get to work with his boy, who is just as nice as you can imagine. And Jason Biggs from the American Pie movies is just the sweetest kid. And we have a ball together, so I am um, I'm incredibly fortunate. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. Uh, okay. First off, I'd personally like to welcome you to Canada. It is my pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Good to be here. And by the way, I got through customs really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for making the call. Uh, all right. So, anyway, um, I'm just truly impressed with uh, how diverse uh, work you do. Thank like, you. Like, uh, I have to, I gotta make a living. <laughs> yeah, well, and pers personally speaking, as a gamer, I, I loved you the most as a gray fox. Oh my god, you know, it's funny you say that because my son said the same thing. One day he came home from, uh, was he still in college? And he, he was uh, almost put off, and he said, Hey man, I need to talk to you about something. And I said, Are you okay? Is somebody pregnant or what? Yeah. <laughs> Typical father response. He said, no, dude, you didn't tell me that you were Gray Fox on Metal Gear or whatever it is. And I said, well, I don't give you a breakdown of every job I've ever done, man. All I know is I pick your goddamn graces. So. You don't give me any crap. And uh, he said, no, no, it's just, I mean, that, that's just unbelievable that my dad is Gray Fox. And I, I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> and it's not because I'm arrogant. It's because I'm lucky enough to be busy. And I may do something that doesn't come out until a year later, and sometimes a video game is going to hit for like a year and a half later, or it takes a while to filter out, or, you know, I, I, there was somebody else who did it before me, and, uh, but yeah, I've had a lot of people who said they, that's the ninja guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Snake. That guy. Yes. Yeah. All he did was whisper, snake, I guess, and fight and die, or do something weird. Yeah. Yeah, and I was actually fighting in that game with the guy who was Leonardo in Ninja Turtles, my father. Oh yeah, he, he was great. Oh, he's Snake. wonderful. But thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And my question is, uh, well, truly, how, uh, what truly inspires you to come up with each character's voice? Um, that's a great question. What is your name, sir? Gordon. Gordon. What What inspires me, um, I think, is a desire to. It sounds really trite, but it's true. I, I, I what I'm inspired by is the is the desire to do the best job I can always do. Having done enough of it now to where I know that if I satisfy myself, that is to say if I make myself laugh or cry or do a character that is uncomfortable, that I would find disturbing, that the audience will probably do. So that when an audience member such as yourself years later comes up and says, I love this show or this freaked me out, man, this was weird. I, I'm used to hearing you singing all these happy songs and I saw you in Batman, the Return of the Dark Knight, or whatever. Dude, it was you. That's good. That's what I want. Um, obviously, that's what the effect I'm trying to achieve. And um, the other thing that inspires me, the people with whom I work are so good at what they do that you can't help but be inspired, whether it's Bruce Tim or Paul Dini writing stuff and producing stuff, or Billy West or Maurice or Tom Kenny. Um, they're very inspirational performers. And so the bar is raised, so you're trying to always do your best work. 
So I'm lucky I get paid to be around people who inspire me. I'm a very fortunate fellow. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. And uh, be sure to say hello to Tara Strong and Mae Whitman and all I the other will. great ones. I've had them on my podcast, and they are just as delightful in real life and incredibly beautiful. They really okay. are beautiful girls. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Gordon. Appreciate it, buddy. Hi, hon. Look at all those you quivers full there. Yes. Midget, you don't get through customs with that, I promise you. <laughs> yeah. So, Pinky and the Brain was always my parents. Oh, don't you have good taste? I have to ask Pinky, yeah. are you pondering what I'm pondering? What is your name? Crystal. Crystal, ask me again. Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Well, I think so, Crystal, but burlap chafes me so. <laughs> I can come all the way from look at you, these fellows, folks behind the stage are laughing. I can come all the way here to my friends up in the Great White North, and all I have to do is say, Narf! <laughs> and you do that. I mean, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Hi. Hello. Uh, my name is Zach. Hi, Zach. Um, Zach, how was oh, it? <laughs> this is wild. What, a, what an incredible experience. Two Zachs in the same room. I know, yeah. Thank you. Dude. Um, well, first thank you for the Ninja Turtles. Thank you. Uh, you mean the New Turtles? All of them. I, yeah. I have all of them. I, I do too, and I have to say one of the cool things again about having a, my son, who's 28, he's kind of in you know the same ballpark. It was great fun for me as a dad, obviously, to have a little boy when I was in turtles. But what's really gratifying now is that my son called me a couple of weeks ago and he'd been watching the new turtles on Hulu. And he said, you know what? I gotta tell you, man, I didn't want to like this show, but it's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it is. The new turtles is quite a I, Incredibly thrilled to be part of it. I was Thank surprised because they generally go on and down. Yeah, no, no, I think it's really good. I think they did a hell of a yeah. good job. Yeah. Um, anyway, my question is uh, you've done a lot of different kinds of act voice acting, mm -hmm. like games, main characters, reoccurring characters, right. bit pieces. Uh, what is your favorite kind? Do you like being the main character? Oh, like, yeah, it's a steady job. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I figured, but I didn't know if, like, what, what kind of challenges that comes yeah, with versus well, the other guys. No, I appreciate what you're asking. What's kind of cute sometimes is folks will text me or ask me on one of these forums, you know, that say, uh, was it really fun working on Ninja Turtles for eight years? Well, and I want to say, what, what about that wouldn't be? Yeah, I mean, exactly. if you're not taking any medication <laughs> and you ask that question, are you kidding me? Yeah, you know. Um, but I understand you. I'm just, I'm just fooling with you. Oh, yeah. The, uh, uh, I, well, it's, it's interesting, actually. It's a good question, because on the one hand, when you're able to be a main character in the context of a, of a hit show, it's great, because you have not only the ability to work steadily, but you get a chance to work with people and develop with other characters. I mean, Maurice and I are, are like brothers. And every time we get together and do an evening with Pinky in the Rain at some theater around you know, the town or whatever, the place is full. People love it. We have a great time. We call each other and, you know, uh, come up with all these bizarre non you know. I think so, Frank, but if Jack Hooks and Britney Spears is Marvin Gaye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's always great to be part of a, of a hit show as a regular for logistical, I mean, for logical reasons and for uh, personal reasons. However, what's also really fun is I do a show called Fairly Odd Parents and... <laughs> I have this recurring guy named Mark Chen, who is this guy from Hugo Batavia who's in love with Mike. <laughs> and with this one-off character that Butch Hartman calls him for, it's turned out probably done 25 or 30 episodes. So it's really neat when you're when you have a one of the questions that, that earlier was about the challenges and what inspires you and all that. Well, when you have a, a, a one-off character that turns out to be over, you know, shows up over and over again, that's that's a really cool thing. So now I have this secondary, or sometimes tertiary characters that I can go and, and or like Squishington, who's a regular on Bump in the Night, but the show hasn't been on for 20 years. Or I do uh, Mark Chang maybe once or twice a year, and people love that character. Um, and so that, that also is really fun. I, 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 so it's a great compliment to me when not only do I get that job, but people remember a character that was supposed to only be a one-off. And you can make the argument that I and the people who, because I'm, I'm just a part of the show, I don't draw the characters, but that it worked well enough so that it is a recurring character. So it's, it's, uh, it presents a, um, a fun challenge either way. Can I have one other question? Sure. Um, the other question I was going to ask is, is there any particular um, 
people that inspire you or that you call up for ideas or you're stuck on an idea? Um, I don't really ever. Well, as I said earlier, it's not that I call somebody up, but I, I am surrounded by people who inspire me. Yeah. I mean, I'm in a room with Billy West and Mae Whitman, Kevin Michael Richardson, and Frank Welker, and Jeff Bennett, and Dee Bradley Baker, and Tara. Nice What's that? It's a nice room. Yeah. <laughs> These people are all my good friends. That's why the podcast is successful. They're all on my cell phone. And I just, you know, Mark Hamill, and, and they're all my buddies. Um, and so when you're surrounded by people like that, just listening to them and being around them, and Billy and I, Billy and I have done panels together, and Maurice and I have done panels, and Jess Harnell and I have done panels, and Peter Cullen and all of us, we're just good friends, and I've known these guys for years, and so when you're surrounded by them, they inspire me. I steal from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. Hi. Hi. Um, before I start, I dig your ears. Thank you. Nice to see you. Um, before I start, I just want to say that I saw you over here on the floor. And anytime you walk by me, I'm thinking, okay, don't say anything, because you can ask a question at the panel, you can get your heart back started, okay? Oh, bless you. <laughs> well, you're welcome to, I promise you, I don't bite. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a total geek nerd fan, just like you guys. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm a fan of the medium, and I'm completely enamored by you guys. The fact that anybody pays attention to what I do is very sweet, so please. I'm one of you. I'm not special. <laughs> the funny thing is that I actually had to write down my question. Oh, dear. When I got up here, it's like, I don't know what to say. Oh, well, so you're doing pretty well. I'm hoping that this so question so good. is anti-climatic. So you've been a voice for a lot of characters that have been a part of our childhood, and as we've progressed, and you've inspired people to do things. And right. Yeah. And so do you feel that you have influenced, influenced our lives in some positive way, and maybe possibly shaped us into who we are today? He's, well, not if you're, um, not if you're, uh, uh, let's see, <laughs> David Berkowitz. Uh, you guys don't know that. He was, he was a, a mass murderer. <laughs> so I hate to think that I have any, you know, I hope Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't a fan. <laughs> but, uh, well, let me, that's a very, that's a really lovely question. And first of all, the, the fact that, that you would allude to the fact that I have something to do with shaping somebody's, um, uh, you know, the good part of somebody's childhood or their or their adulthood is improved. It really is unquantifiable how sweet that is to say. Um, I uh, don't take it lightly. The fact that I do what I do, and I know having worked in this medium for almost 30 years, that clearly there are millions of people who watch these shows. And I don't take it lightly when I meet someone like yourself or the, uh, the other side. Um, or any of the folks here uh, and around North America so far uh, who have come up to me and said, you know, you're the voice of my childhood. And virtually always it's a happy thing. Um, and it's, I should say it, it is always a happy thing. Sometimes the circumstances are not happy when the people relate things to me, but they always end up happy. And what I mean by that is I get people all the time who will come up to me and say, um, you know, Mr. Paulson or Rob, uh, you, my brother had leukemia and the only thing that got us through watching it was Ninja Turtles. Or I was bullied and Ninja Turtles got me through that and taught me about, you know, um, uh, self-respect and I got into martial arts and I'm okay and now I watch Turtles and it means way more to me than just an action figure. And I, I really, honest to God, I can't tell you how lovely that is to hear. Um, I, uh, I am incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to be part of your childhood. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm writing a book right now, and the working title is, Dude, Your Childhood is a Middle-Aged White Guy. <laughs> well, I'm only 22, so I don't feel middle-aged. Well, no, no, not your, your childhood is me. I am firmly ensconced in middle age. Trust me. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the fact that you say that, I'm incredibly flattered. And when you say, do I think that I've had something to do with that? Well, I would be very arrogant and presumptive to, to assume that I did. But to the extent that people tell me that I have, uh, I am beyond flattered by that. And I don't take it lightly. Um, the opportunity now to go speak to a group of people, if I have 500 people, the truth is that I could have a fan base of eight years old to 40. 
and that's like very manual. I mean, you know, <laughs> you got it without the schmaltz, hopefully. But you've got uh, literally people who say, I watched Turtles when I was a kid, and now I watch them with my kid, and you're doing Turtles again, and I don't know, I'm old enough to be everybody's, almost, almost everybody's father here. You're like this kind of uncle to all of us. It's nice to see some people who are within 15 years of my range, except for your lovely wife, who's clearly out of your pay grade. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mine is too, so. Um, but I, I honestly, I really, really can't tell you how grateful I am to to know that some people feel that way, and I don't take it lightly, and I'm very respectful of the fan base, I'm very respectful of the shows on which I work, and I know that uh, Ninja Turtles, for instance, um, is very important to a lot of people for many more reasons than just uh, ratings and, and action figures. So thank you very much. Hey, you're welcome. Appreciate that. See you take care, bud. Hi. Uh, You're already smiling. I am. It's I'm not, not gas. Is it? No, I'm <laughs> uh, so basically, um, uh, my girlfriend's the one that really made me aware of, you know, uh, the talent. That Smart girl. Have. Yes, yeah. for sure. Uh, so, you know, when I look up uh, yourself and many other names that work for which are really great. Sure. You look at your resume on the IMDb, it's just gigantic, it's huge. Um, but my question was more related to, you know, it's a, it's a, a lot of focus on TV, video games. Uh, there is some of you, but not as much. Right. So, like there's, uh, for example, like the Transformers where Peter Paul was able to reprise the role, but Frank Walker wasn't. Yeah. And specifically with Disney, you see a lot of uh, some celebrities. Celebrities talent. Where, yeah, they're talented, but they're not voice acting with people. They're, right. they're lending their voices. So right. I, was, I was wondering if there's maybe any anime. I know Oscar's more really problem with for that. Not from me. I, I am, I, I get it. I'm a capitalist. This is, you know, we, we have to make money. This is a, this is a for-profit business. I mean, surprise, these people didn't actually have to bring me, but I'm getting paid to be here. Now, it's a labor of love, and trust me, I'm not going to get rich, but this, all of this is more remuneration than the actual dollar stuff that I get, okay? So it's my gig. I mean, I have to make a living. However, I also understand that if Disney says it's going to put butts in the seats to have Brad Pitt be the talking chicken in their movie, it's their money. They can do whatever they like. I, I have other friends of mine who are very resentful, and I understand that side of it too, because we work really hard to do our gig, and we make, trust me, we get paid very well, but we don't get paid movie star money. And I know that I've gone in and sunk for celebrity talent who are making 10 times what I'm making um, for less work but they become celebrities. You know, Brad Pitt didn't know anybody when he went to LA. Good for him. And I, it'd be kind of cool to be incredibly good looking and incredibly famous and incredibly rich for a day. You know, that'd be cool. But there are a lot of people who would like my career, so I'm incredibly fortunate too. The, the, the way that I look at celebrities that are brought in, that will never change because, you know, John Hamm is, uh, you know, from, um, yeah, from Mad Men. Incredibly gifted actor, incredibly handsome, and is parlaying his work on screen into a lot of voice work. He's the voice of Mercedes Benz. He's now the voice of American Airlines. I think he's the voice of uh, Buckman or Anderson or one of the, you know, Tylenol, I think. And you know, I know that uh, I was for years the voice of Mr. Opportunity for Honda. They, had, they used to sell Hondas at the end of every model year, and they'd have, I would be just the animated guy. Well, but when I was doing, Kevin Spacey was the main voice for Honda. And I know that he's probably getting seven or eight hundred thousand dollars a year for that. But he's Kevin Spacey. He won two Oscars. He's, he didn't know anybody when he got started either. He's just a brilliant actor. My feeling is that those folks all earned what they got. If producers want to spend the money, just like you know, George Steinbrenner gave A Rod a quarter of a billion dollars to play baseball. He can't hit a baseball anymore. He'll probably move somewhere else. Well, it's, it's interesting, actually. It's a good question, because on the one hand, when you're able to be a main character in the context of a, of a hit show, it's great. Because you have not only the ability to work steadily, but you get a chance to work with people and develop other characters. I mean, Maurice and I are, are like brothers. And every time we get together and do an evening with Pinky in the Rain at some theater around you know, the town or whatever, the place is full. People love it. We have a great time. We call each other and, you know, uh, come up with all these bizarre non suckers you know. I think so, Frank, but if Jan Hooks and Britney Spears is Marvin Gaye. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's always great to be part of a, of a hit show as a regular for logistical, I mean, for logical reasons and for uh, personal reasons. 
However, what's also really fun is I do a show called Fairly Odd Parents, and, <laughs> and I have this recurring guy named Mark Chen, who is this guy from Udopatavia who's in love with Vicky. With this one off character that Butch Hartman calls him for, it's turned out probably done 25 or 30 episodes. So it's really neat when you're, when you have a, one of the questions that, that earlier was about the challenges and what inspires you and all that. Well, when you have a, a, a one off character that turns out to be, over, you know, shows up over and over again, that's, that's a really cool thing. So now I have this secondary or sometimes tertiary characters that I can go and or like Squishington, who's a regular on Bump of the Night, but the show hasn't been on for 20 years. Or I do uh, Mark Chang maybe once or twice a year, and people love that character. Um, and so that, that also is really fun. I, uh, uh, so it's a great compliment to me when not only do I get that job, but people remember a character that was supposed to only be a one-off. And you can make the argument that I and the people who, because I'm, I'm just a part of the show, I don't draw the characters, but that it worked well enough so that it was, so it's it's uh, it presents a um, a fun challenge either way. Can I make one of them? Sure. Um, the other question I was going to ask is: Is there any particular um, people that inspire you, or that you call up for ideas when you're stuck on an idea? Um, I don't really ever. Well, as I said earlier, it's not that I call somebody up, but I I am surrounded by people who inspire me. Yeah. I mean, I'm in a room with Billy West and. Mae Whitman, Kevin Michael Richardson, and Frank Welker, and Jeff Bennett, and Dee Bradley Baker, and That's Tara. Nice What's that? It's a nice room. Yeah! <laughs> These people are all my good friends. That's why the podcast is successful. They're all on my cell phone. I just, you know, Mark Hamill, and, and they're all my buddies. Um, and so when you're surrounded by people like that, just listening to them, and being around them, and Billy and I, Billy and I have done panels together, and Maurice and I have done panels, and Jess Harnell and I have done panels, and, Peter Cullen and all of us, we're just good friends and I've known these guys for years and so when you're surrounded by them, they inspire you. I steal from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. Hi. Hi. Um, before I start. I dig your ears. Thank you. Nice to see you. Um, before I start, I just want to say that I saw you over here on the floor and anytime you walk by me, I'm thinking, okay, don't say anything because you can ask a question to the panel, you can't get your heart back started. Okay? Oh, bless you. Right. Well, you're welcome to have, I promise you, I don't bite. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a total geek nerd fan, just like you guys. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm a fan of the medium, and I'm completely enamored by you guys. The fact that anybody pays attention to what I do is very sweet, so please. I'm one of you. I'm not special. <laughs> well, the funny thing is that I actually had to write down my question. Oh, dear. When I got up here, it's like, I don't know what to say. Okay. Well, so you're doing pretty well. I'm hoping that this so far so good. Anti-climatic, but so you've been a voice for a lot of characters that have been a part of our childhood, and as we've progressed, and you've inspired people to do things. And right. You want to this podcast, right? Yeah. And so, do you feel that you have influenced influenced our lives in some positive way, and maybe possibly shaped us into who we are today? Jeez. Well, not if you're um, not if you're uh, uh, let's see, <laughs> David Berkowitz. You guys don't know that he was, he was a mass murderer. So I hate to think that I have any. You know, I hope Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't a fan. <laughs> but uh, well, let me. That's a very, that's a really lovely question. And first of all, the, the fact that that you would allude to the fact that I have something to do with shaping somebody's, um, uh, you know. The good part of somebody's childhood or their or their adulthood is improved. It really is unquantifiable how sweet that is to say. Um, I uh, don't take it lightly. The fact that I do what I do, and I know having worked in this medium for almost 30 years, that clearly there are millions of people who watch these shows, and I don't take it lightly when I meet someone like yourself or the, uh, the other side, um, or any of the votes here. Uh, and around North America so far, uh, who have come up to me and said, you know, you're the voice of my childhood. And virtually always, it's a happy thing. Um, and it's, I should say, it, it is always a happy thing. Sometimes the circumstances are not happy when the people relate things to me, but they always end up happy. And what I mean by that is, I get people all the time who will come up to me and say, um, you know, Mr. Paulson or Rob, uh, you, 
my brother had leukemia, and the only thing that got us through watching it was Ninja Turtles. Or I was bullied, and Ninja Turtles got me through that and taught me about, you know, um, uh, self-respect, and I got into martial arts, and I'm okay, and now I watch Turtles, and it means way more to me than just an action figure. And I, I really, honest to God, I can't tell you how lovely that is to hear. Um, I, uh, I am incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to be part of your childhood. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm writing a book right now, and the working title is, Dude, Your Childhood is a Middle-Aged White Guy. <laughs> well, I'm only 22, so I don't feel middle-aged. Well, no, no, not your, your childhood is me. I am firmly ensconced in middle age. Trust me. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the fact that you say that, uh, I, I'm incredibly flattered. And when you say, do I think that I've had something to do with that? Well, I would be very arrogant and presumptive to, to assume that I did. But to the extent that people tell me that I have, uh, I am beyond flattered by that. And I don't take it lightly. Um, the opportunity now to go speak to a group of people, if I have 500 people, the truth is that I could have a fan base of eight years old to 40. And that's like a very man though. I mean, you know, <laughs> you got it without the schmaltz, hopefully. But you've got uh, literally people who say, I watched Turtles when I was a kid, and now I watch them with my kid, and you're doing Turtles again, and I don't know, I'm old enough to be everybody's, almost, almost everybody's father here. You're like the kind of uncle to all of us. It's nice to see some people who are within 15 years of my range, except for your lovely wife, who's clearly out of your pay grade. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mine is too, so. Um, but I, I honestly, I really, really can't tell you how grateful I am to to know that some people feel that way, and I don't take it lightly, and I'm very respectful of the fan base, I'm very respectful of the shows on which I work, and I know that uh, Ninja Turtles, for instance, um, is very important to a lot of people for many more reasons than just uh, ratings and, and action figures. So thank you very much. Hey, you're welcome. Appreciate that. See you take care, bud. Hi. Uh, You're already smiling. I am. It's not gas. Is it? No. <laughs> uh, so basically, um, uh, my girlfriend's the one that really made me aware of, you know, uh, the talent. That Boy Smart girl. Had. Yes, yeah. for sure. Uh, so, you know, when I look up uh, yourself and many of the names that work for which normally pretty sure. well, you look at your resume on the IMDb, and it's just gigantic, huge. Um, but my question was more related to, you know, it's a, it's a, a lot of focus on TV, video games. Uh, there is some of you, but not as much. Right. So, like there's, uh, for example, like the Transformers where Peter Collins is able to reprise the role, like Frank Walker wasn't. Yeah. And specifically with Disney, you see a lot of uh, celebrities. Celebrity talent. Where, they're yeah, talented, but they're not voice acting with people. They're, just, right. they're lending their voices. Right. So I was wondering if there's maybe any anime. I know Oscar's more problem with for that. Not from me. I, I am, I, I get it. I'm a capitalist. This is, you know, we we have to make money. This is a this is a for-profit business. I mean, surprise, these people are not actually have to bring me, but I'm getting paid to be here. Now, it's a labor of love, and trust me, I'm not gonna get rich, but this, all of this is more remuneration than the actual dollar stuff that I get, okay? So it's my gig. I mean I have to make a living. However, I also understand that if Disney says it's going to put butts in the seats to have Brad Pitt be the talking chicken in their movie, it's their money. They can do whatever they like. I, I have other friends of mine who are very resentful, and I understand that side of it too, because we work really hard to do our gig, and we make, trust me, we, we get paid very well, but we don't get paid movie star money. And I know that I've gone in and sunk for celebrity talent who are making ten times what I'm making um, for less work. But they become celebrities. You know, Brad Pitt didn't know anybody when he went to LA. Good for him. And I, I it'd be kind of cool to be incredibly good looking and incredibly famous and incredibly rich for a day. You know, that'd be cool. But there are a lot of people who would like my career, so I'm incredibly fortunate too. The, 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 the way that I look at celebrities that are brought in, that will never change because, you know, John Han is, uh, you know, from. Um, yeah, from Batman. Incredibly gifted actor, incredibly handsome, and is parlaying his work on screen into a lot of voice work. He's the voice of Mercedes Benz. He's now the voice of American Airlines. I think he's the voice of uh, Buckman or Anderson or one of the, you know, Taiwan, I think. 
And you know, I know that uh, I was for years the voice of Mr. Opportunity for Honda. They, they used to sell Hondas at the end of every model year, and they had I would be just the animated guy. Well, when, when I was doing Kevin Spacey was the main voice for Honda, and I know that he's probably getting seven or eight hundred thousand dollars a year for that. But he's Kevin Spacey. He won two Oscars. He's, he didn't know anybody when he got started either. He's just a brilliant actor. My feeling is that those folks all earned what they got. If producers want to spend the money, just like, you know, George Steinbrenner gave a rod a quarter of a million dollars to play baseball, he can't hit a baseball anymore. He'll probably go somewhere else. But hey, man, that's what the market bared for, um, for Mr. Steinbrenner. My feeling is that I can only be as good as I can be. So that if, it, if a producer says, I really, 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 really want to spend a million dollars to get actor A to play this character, all I can do is, if I get the chance to audition for it, is to be so good that the producer says, yeah, this guy's really good, but I just really want to spend the money. I can't help that. However, it has changed a bit in my favor and in our favor because I do a, a character, a character named Bubble in all the Tinkerbell movies, in which I play for some strange reason a fellow with a Scottish accent. And I'm a Tinker Fairy and I'm very comfortable with that. <laughs> and Initially, that was going to be cast uh, uh, by uh, one of the fellows who was uh, in the play with Sean Astin in one of the in the Lord of the Rings movies, and blah blah blah. And they wanted to have this guy. They brought me in and said, "We'd love to hire this guy, but we can't understand him. So, would you come in and read this thing? And we're going to still use him and pay him all this money, but we want you to do the scratch vocal." And ultimately, after an opportunity, he said, "Why would you do that? You know, you got me here, and Jeff Bennett, and blah blah blah." Well. John Lasseter, God bless him, said, these guys are perfect, right? Let's hire these guys. So that was an opportunity where my doing my best work got me the job over the sort of quasi-celebrity, which I know was going to make a lot more money. Um, so I did my gig better, and I got the gig. It's never going to change that celebrities are going to get more money because of their celebrity. So I'm trying to cultivate my own work and get better and better and better and better. Um, luckily, I'm not limited by being an average guy, so I get to be hired for things I wouldn't be considered for on camera. But I don't have any animosity. It's just it, it's it's showbiz, and I hope someday that I can call it and say, "Yeah, we just really want Rob and I to give him a million bucks." <laughs> but thank you very much. That's kind of you to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello, nurse. This is the best part of my day. <laughs> okay, so my question is kind of been answered by like everybody. So I'm just going to say. Um, my brother has autism, he's 21 years old. I want to thank you for giving us far to annoy the crap out of my mother oh, good. for years to come. So, <laughs> thank you very oh, much. Oh, honey, it's my pleasure. <laughs> and I have an autistic guy, a severely autistic. Um, interesting. He was di diagnosed as severely autistic nephew, my, my oldest nephew. But now he's 21 and he's so high functioning. And I'm so proud of my sister and people like you and your mother. Um, I understand how much love and commitment and patience and patience and patience and patience it takes. Very well there. And um, when I see my nephew doing so well and having a job and living his life, it's very great. So thank you. Thank you. What's in my pocket? What is in your pocket? I'm not sure. No, I have, I have My last name is Kreskin, so I don't know. I, uh, I was going to ask you, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? There's one in every crowd. <laughs> I, I think that I'd probably take the horse-sized duck because I'm, I'm pretty funny and I can make him <laughs> Hi, Hewitt, sir. Nice to see you again. Hi. Hi, Tom. Uh, two quick questions. First, of all the sh TV shows that you've been in, which would you say has been the worst? The worst? Just in over uh, overall quality. Um, I did a show a few years ago. You know, it's hard for me to say the worst because I'm very aware of how many people work on a show and nobody starts out to make a bad movie or a bad show, and I've been in several. But it's not like anybody starts and spends all that money and all that time to make something that sucks. So it's difficult, it's, yeah, it's difficult to say, it's difficult, what, what is the worst thing I've been in that you think of, that you can think of? Is there anything? <laughs> and, and trust me, I've got, I've got, I 
I've got a very thick skin and I've already cashed the checks, so I don't care if somebody says this sucked. But, um... Like before time 12? Yeah, some of those were pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, that's just a land before though. time. Well, and, and the Turtles, I mean, I love the original Turtles being part of it, but it did sort of morph toward the end of the run into, I, the, there were mistakes with all, uh, which Turtle was speaking, and the wrong voice coming out of the wrong guy. And I think those are even on the internet. You know, I mean, it's all your dirty laundry is there. Trust me, if you have any public persona at all, it all ends up on the internet. Um, I did, uh, oh God, yeah, that was, that was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> there were, I'm trying to think, is there was some stuff, oh, there was a show I worked on in Hanna-Barbera called Snorks, which was sort of a, a watered, a, a version of the, of the Smurfs underwater, kind of. That was pretty nice. Um, <laughs> And I'm not being coy. I, I, I've been lucky enough to do enough work so that I, have, I can forget about the bad stuff. But I honestly, if you folks want to come up to me and say, Mr. Paulson, you're a decent guy. You seem like you don't hurt people. But this really, no. Blue. Blue, I think, is the, opera, is the correct term. Sucked. It's awful. Um, I'm not so right kind of thing. But I, I, I will, I'll think about that. I'll, I'll try to come up with something. But thank you for asking. Okay. Um, second. My girlfriend really wanted to come to this panel and she couldn't make it. Could you look to my camera there and say hi to her in Pinky's voice? Her name's Jamie. Camera in the corner there? Yes. And what is her name? Jamie. Jamie? Hey, Tom. You're Tom, right? Yeah. Hey, yeah, Jamie. Tom is here. He's got, I came in from this far away. I can smell cheap booze on this. <laughs> so let me tell you, Tom, I completely understand why you sent him by himself. <laughs> you must think he, he needs to get a better job or better booze. Clearly, he's got the right girl. But all I can say to you, and I mean this from the bottom of my pink little stupid heart, <laughs> NARF! Yeah, he's a great kid. Um, what's really funny now is it's funny to get to a place where you can call somebody who's 38 a kid. 40 is a kid. <laughs> so I tell people, I was, people don't know this, but I was the entertainer at the Last Supper. <laughs> of course, in those days, I was Shecky of Arimathea. Walked in the lab, Jesus, what a party. And everything was going great until Judas decided to do a karaoke version of Backstabbers. Very tasteless. So, um, yeah, Jason Marsden, um, I, it's hard for me to be presumptuous because I would, that would presume that, that they think I'm their mentor, but Jason has told me that. Um, uh, there are a couple of uh, folks, oh, Yuri Lohenfeld, whom I adore, and his adorable wife, Tara Platt. Uh, Yuri and Tara wrote a book called Voice Over Voice Actor, which if you're interested, you should get it, it's very good. Um, but Yuri is the, uh, he's Ben on Ben 10. And I work with Yuri a lot, and he's uh, incredibly talented, very handsome young fellow. And he has told me that, that I'm kind of helping him out. Um, I, uh, I have a number of students, private students, who have told me uh, as such, several of whom are in I have students in uh, Holland, Vancouver, Australia, and all over the US, and um, they've also said the same. So, uh, if that is true, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. It's a very precious thing to trust somebody with your talent, so thank you for asking. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, Ken, look at your ears! I know you're not supposed to be me, but you are quite attractive, I must tell you. <laughs> uh, first of all, great. Really great to meet you. Um, thank you, sweetie. Are you a fan of uh, animation? Okay. Just the production behind it. I want to ask... Are you an artist? Uh, Obvious. Good, well, because I can't even dress stick figures, so that's cool. Um, I do want to ask, when it comes to coming from a artist point of view, when we're designing a character, we often have the voice or the perspective of what the voice was like in our head. We do, okay. Despite, you know, not being able to mimic it. Have right. you ever had animators, you know, try recording with you, like, what they picture? Yes. What's your name? Uh, Chris. Chris, yes, Chris. Thank you for asking. I, I have um, uh, often do that. One of my best buddies in LA is a guy named Doug Tenable. And Doug did a show for which he got a lot of acclaim. Here's a book called Earthworm Champion. 
Doug uh, hired me to do a show at Nickelodeon years ago called Cat Scratch. And it was only on for a season. It was a great cast. It was Kevin McDonald from Kids in the Hall. It was me. It was uh, Maurice LaMarche, another Canadian from Dimmons Ontario there. And uh, uh, Wayne Knight, who played uh, um, Newman, Newman. On, on Seinfeld. And, and uh, Doug and I are good friends, and we talked several times at dinner about what he wanted to do my character and other characters to sound like. And often it helps animators to have guys like me or Maurice or Frank or Dean or any of these guys come in and throw stuff out at them as they're producing a show. More often than not, we come in after the fact and we start rooting for a bunch of people and then they would decide, you know, we hear this a lot. We don't know what we want the character to sound like, but we'll know it when we hear it. Well, that is, that's a tough thing. You can either make it drive you crazy, or you can just start to throw up as much stuff as you can and see what happens. It worked really well with me and the animators in a show called Jimmy Neutron, because I was Carol Weezer, and I know that's how weird is that? See that come out of my head? I love your pink hair. That's a color found in nature, not usually on a human, but that's good. But what's so great is that when that character came around, you know, you look at the sort of roundness of the character and the fact that he's kind of a quiet guy. I did a different version of that character on Goof Troop, where I played PJ. And then it was even more over the top in another show called Danny Phantom, where I played the Box Ghost. That's one of the oddball characters. But it's all kind of the same placement, except Carl's down here in Quieter. He has an inhaler. And a lazy L. So, um, yeah, we work very closely with the animators and kind of mix and match. It's really nice when I have a chance, when I know I already got the gig, and they say, we, we want you, what have you got? Um, that's on a, on a show I'm doing right now from a web called Bravo Man, which is being done by Namco Bandai, who did Pac-Man and some of the other video games. So if you go to shiftylook.com, S-H-I-F-T-Y, look.com, um, myself, Dee Bradley Baker, who was Perry the Platypus on uh, Phineas and Ferb, and also the two uh, robots in the portal. That's Dee, incredibly gifted actor. And also the clones and Clone Wars. And myself and Dee and Romy Dames, who uh, was uh, regular on uh, Hannah Montana. The three of us are doing these voices in Bravo Man. Um, so it's a web-based cartoon that's pretty cool. And in that case, they hired me and said, we want to develop a character with you. It's always going to be too So it was easier when they had already character designed from presented to you and you were just asked? Yeah, it's always nice. It's, well, I shouldn't say it's easier. It's, it's, the challenge, at least, is that I don't have to worry about getting the job. I already, it's, like, it's like being on the roster every year for the, the next year on the team. You know, you got the gig. It's just a question of showing up at training camp and making sure you're in good shape. I don't worry about it. But um, it's always a fun challenge. And thank you very thank much. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Hello, other nurse. <laughs> Hi. I like you. Hi. Happy birthday to you. Wow. Hi. All of a sudden I just fall over. Hi. Um, my favorite thing that you did was at the very end of every Pinky and the Brain episode, you had that one line that throws Brain off. Right. Oh, the, the non sequiturs? Yeah. Yes, where you, where Pinky, at, where Brain asked me, am I pondering? Yeah. Okay. Would you like to hear one? Another one? What is your name? Autumn. Autumn? Yes. Yes, oh my god. This is so sweet. So if you would say, if you would say, Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? That'd be great. Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Well, I think so, Autumn, but if Jimmy cracks corner, nobody cares. Why does he keep doing it? <laughs> Great. Um, and I came across this one fan art of Animaniacs. It's uh, basically a recreation of the world of the three characters. Yeah. But she uh, inserted herself as another Animaniac character, and she's your girlfriend. Oh, she is. <laughs> how lovely. I was wondering how you felt about that. Are you kidding me? Any time that any lady with a pulse, <laughs> as opposed to one without, um, Finds me attractive in any iteration? Are you kidding me? I'm a very I, listen. I, I I realize that, like I said, these folks are the folks that pay my mortgage. 
Anybody <laughs> that finds me attractive, whether it's a cartoon character or a person, I'm always very flattered. It's a little bit on the odd side sometimes. <laughs> but hey, you're looking at a guy who, you know, makes my living doing what used to get me in trouble in seventh grade, so who am I to judge? I'm just really flattered that anybody finds any of my characters attractive. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sweetie. <clears throat> Hi. How you doing, sir? Oh, I'm pretty good today. How are you? I'm okay. So far, so good. Well, I was wondering in your uh, long career if there were any missed opportunities for projects or particular roles that either you passed up voluntarily or you couldn't take as a schedule or whatever reason that come. And uh, then looking back in retrospect, you thought, I really wish I had gotten that, that game. Or, or I could have done something. I, I think not. I could have done something better than the actor they got. Yeah, that's a good What's your name? My name's Ben. Ben, thanks for asking. Um, it's an interesting question, Ben. I um, uh, we were talking about this last night. The one role that I got really close on that I wish I had done is um, uh, Philip J. Fry in Futurama. Um, but Billy West is one is like a brother to me, and they made the right choice. Billy's better. He he was better than me in that role, and they made the right choice. And clearly, they you can't blame them, argue with them because the show's it's Futurama. <laughs> So uh, I wish I'd gotten that one because I got really close, but hey man, if I die five minutes from now, I have had a hell of a run. I'm a pretty lucky guy. But the other side of that is there are shows I've passed up. Um, actually recently, Seth Green is a, is a friend and incredibly gifted, and I love Robot Chicken. Um, but there was an episode where they, they wanted the Animaniacs, they, they kind of lampooned the Animaniacs, which is great. And I totally get what it is about that show that people like, they like the irreverence, I totally get that. When um, they presented it to me and to Tress and to Jess, who were Yakko, Dot, and Wacko, respectively, um, all of us chose to take a pass on it because it was kind of like, you know, we're Animaniacs, we're busy smoking crack, and we're going to kill ourselves and drive our car off a cliff. And I, I totally get that. I'm not a prude. I've been around. This is my first rodeo, all of that. But I also know that those characters, like we were talking about earlier, mean an awful lot to a lot of people. And I know that when I go around, that most people would say, hey, that was pretty funny, we get it. But there might be one person or two people who say, you know, Yakko and Wacko and Doc really were important to me. And that kind of hit me the wrong way. Why did you have to do that? You know, it was the 800 bucks that important to you. And it wasn't that important to me. Um, that is not to say that I wouldn't work on Robot Chicken. I just would not sort of turn up those people I need. Mean, you know what I mean? Um, Yakko and Pinky and those characters are very important to me and consequently to the people who, who have um, you know, paid my mortgage. So I, I don't regret passing up that at all. Um, um, and on, on the other side of it is I can't think of, there isn't much else that I've really passed on because I'm, I have to work. But if it's something really egregious, there are things that I, I look at and go, eh, ah, this isn't for me, I'll just take a pass. I never regret that. Oh, no, I totally get that. Yeah. I was going to ask you to do a box game, but since you already did it. I already did it, man! Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what, what Charlie is like. Oh, he's a complete asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it. No, Bill Butch is great. I was with him on Thursday. I did another show of his called Top Puppy. And um, I love Butch. He's another Detroit. He's from Detroit. Um, Butch is wonderful. He's hired me for 10 years and barely out of parents. He hired me for Danny Fanta. He hired me for... Uh, Tough puppy. Um, he, uh, we worked together the first night of Hanna Barbera. He did a short that he hired me for called Gramps, which was his start. And he and Seth MacFarlane were started at the same time. So they're very good buddies. Um, no, I put you, uh, he's really kind to me. Great guy. You love him. You'll probably see him one of these one days. Great guy. Thank you. Thank you. I won't say that on a plane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you'll get it. You'll, you'll get that later and you'll work. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to thank you and Animaniacs because now I know all the presidents of the United States and the state capitals, thank et cetera. Uh, well, I don't know all the prime ministers, <laughs> so I'm sorry. One of uh, the most favorite things about Animaniacs is the obscure references to things. Yes. And, and they're like, I mentioned uh, Bergman's The Seventh Seal, which I thought was yes. really. How, how hip is that? Yeah, I'd like. <laughs> When I saw that, I would have seen that movie, so, yeah. um, but let me just get to the point. Uh, were there any references you really loved on that show, and can you give any examples? Well, there were many. The one that's the most uh, obvious that kind of got by the censors is the fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> 
of course, it depends on where you, which syllable you put the emphasis on. And so many people think it's so um, that was one. Um, there are just so many. I mean, you know, pianists when they had Kenny Mars played the play with uh, Beethoven, the Bach, the uh, was it Beethoven, I think? He said, I'm a pianist. I said, pianist, you can't say that. <laughs> and not everybody. You know, that kind of stuff. That was, uh, yeah, that was very, there were a lot of them. But thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think, um, unfortunately, Zach, I think this is going to be the last question from this young lady. The only reason I say this is because I, there's one more thing I want to do after this week. Let me ask you a question, okay? But thank you, Zach. Sorry, guys. Can you go ahead? I know, I, it's only because we're running out of time. I wish I could do an hour and a half up here. We have to move to the next question. But I promise you, it'll be worth your while. What is, what is your name? Um, I'm Cody, and I was just wondering, if you could be on any anim, any Japanese anime show, which one would it be, and who would you play? I would love to answer that question, but I'm not as hip as you. <laughs> and I don't know them. The only reason is because I'm not that familiar with anime, because um, most of the anime that's been done up to this point, it's changing a bit, but most of them are non-union jobs. That's not bad. It's just that I'm in the Screen Actors Guild, and I, I can only do jobs that are authorized, you know, for me to do so. Um, I know that my son uh, really loves, um, I used to really dig uh, Full Metal Alchemist, and uh, one of his favorite movies was Ghost in the Shell, loves Ghost in the Shell, um, I, uh, and he was a big fan of Rama, he loved Rama. I, I know that um, right now, um, uh, Yuri Lowenthal works on a show called um, Oh God, I can't remember. It's a very popular Japanese show. He was on one called Bleach. And I don't, you know, which one would you think I'd be best at? I don't know, I'm just wondering, is there, if you could pick any one that you know of, like from any generation, which one would it be? Oh, you know what, I would, would like to be, I would have loved to have been, um, I had uh, Steve Bloom on my podcast, and um, I would have liked to, he did a, did a character, you guys know which one Steve Bloom did? Spike. That was the one. Uh, but that was, what was the name of the show? That's the one I would have chose. The reason, honestly, I'd say that is because I, after I had Steve on, I went back and watched Cowboy Bebop, and I really dug that. And it's, I'm not trying to be difficult, I just, most of the stuff I do is not anime, although I have incredible, clearly it's huge. It but thank you for asking. So, thank you for being here. Be, be, before you go, I, I know there are several people who want to hear this, and if you don't, please bear with me. Um, and if you know the words, sing along. It's the Canadian National Anthem. <laughs> but first, we're going to try this. <clears throat> United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic, Dominican, Canada, Peru, I'm 